I am so pleased to introduce our final speaker. This man's courageous work to defend liberty and expose the harm being done to our children was the inspiration behind this entire event. Alex Newman is an award-winning international journalist, educator, author, and consultant who seeks to glorify God in everything he does. He has written for a wide array of publications in the United States and abroad. He currently serves as a foreign correspondent for the New American Magazine, as a contrib contributor to the Epic Times, a writer for WND, World Net Daily, an education writer for Freedom Project Media, a correspondent for the Law Enforcement Intelligent Brief, and much more. I said earlier that his uh, work inspired this event. Alex wrote a series of articles that were published in the New American Magazine titled Rescuing Our Children. This magazine inspired the woman behind this event, Ronnie Moore, to do something and help spread the word about the dangers our children are faced with. I have also been deeply impacted by Alex Newman. I began working with Florida Citizens Alliance as an intern three years ago, and I would repost his articles almost weekly on social media, and I always looked forward to reading the next one. His work has made a huge impact on my decision to get involved in helping K-12 students in Florida find alternatives to public school. Alex Newman digs deep and finds the truth, no matter how unsettling it may be. Please give a warm welcome to Alex Newman. Thank you all so much for being here, for everybody watching at home through the live stream. Thank you. And I, I normally start my speeches with a joke because that's what they teach you to do at public speaking school. But uh, I just came from a funeral and it, it just underscored so much what's at stake here. Uh, I was a young relative of mine and the Bible says that Satan roars around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour your children, okay? And you've heard at this conference today, yesterday, it's coming through the entertainment industry, it's coming through the public school system. I'm gonna show you today what the government school system is doing to our children. And, you know, homeschooling, it's not gonna save your children. Jesus Christ saves your children. But it's your job as a parent to protect your children from that evil lion that wants to devour them. And if you don't do it, who's gonna do it? You think the politicians are gonna do it for you? Of course they won't, right? I'm gonna show you what they're doing right now to your children. Um, there we go, look, look at these polls. This data is just mind blowing. 70% of my generation, it's always terribly embarrassing to admit you're a millennial because everybody just looks at you like, oh, you're a dummy, okay, that's good. Uh, but 70% of my generation it describes themselves as socialist. Okay, our freedom in this country is not going to survive another generation, folks, and the data proves it. Uh, you keep looking here. Millennials, again, the first generation in all of American history where Christians are in the minority, and the next generation after us is even worse. You guys remember when Obama said, whatever we once were, we're no longer a Christian nation. It pains me like you can't imagine to agree with Obama. But he was right. That's the direction we're moving in. We are no longer a Christian nation if this continues. 50% uh, of young Americans today say they don't even know if God exists. And that takes some brainwashing. I'll tell you, they've done studies. Children all over the world understand that they were created by a God who's loving and who's all-powerful. It doesn't matter if their parents are Hindus or Buddhists or atheists. It doesn't matter. They all understand that they were created by a God who's wonderful and powerful and loving. Now, Adolf Hitler... Total monster, national socialist. Speaking of socialists, if you wonder what's coming for us, just look at all the other nations that have fallen to socialism. Hitler was a socialist, and he was wrong about almost everything, but he was right about one thing. And this is one of those real quotes. You know, there's so many fake quotes, but this is a real one. He alone who owns the youth gains the future. And Curtis talked about that earlier. Right? All the dictators of the 20th century understood. If you want to dominate the future, the way to do it is to dominate the minds and the hearts of the children. And this is now a reality in the United States. A lot of people don't, haven't realized yet that this is the direction we're moving in. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Yeah, kids belong to the whole community, right? <laughs> Collective child rearing. Uh, that's insane. 
But that's on national television. That's on one of these so-called mainstream networks. They're telling your children, they're not yours. God didn't give them to you. They, God gave them to the whole community. Right? And we'll see what happens when the community raises them. Now, this is official federal policy. During the final years of the Obama administration, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education put out this policy statement. It was still online last time I looked. They said parents get to be equal partners in the new world with the government in the raising of their own children. And that's contingent on mandatory home visits. We want to make sure the home environment is acceptable to the other partner. Of course, parents will be the junior partners before long. And you should read this document. This is where they're going. <clears throat> Uh, this was the uh, Secretary of Education under Obama for seven years. Look at how open they've become. Home. And there are certain kids we should have 24-7 to really create a safe environment and give them a chance. Um, I think all of our schools should be community centers. Our schools should be open 12, 13, 14 hours a day with a wide variety of after school. Yeah, so eight hours a day is not enough. So we just need some of the kids 24-7 and the others 12, 14 hours a day, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you can give them a good night hug if you're lucky, right? Uh, and Hillary Clinton told us this was coming over 20 years ago, two decades ago. She said it takes a village to raise the children. And by village, she means government, right? So the government's going to raise your children. And here's what happens when the government raises your children. I'm from Florida. We had a shooting down there. And... Uh, these two geniuses appeared on every national media network, and you should have heard them. I mean, I don't know if you watch much TV. I don't, and I don't recommend it. But if you did, you saw these kids on TV, the girl with the communist Cuban patch, said, our parents don't know how to run an effing democracy. Just wait till we're in charge. We're going to disarm everybody, and then we won't have any more school shootings. Hmm. I guess nobody told them that in the 1930s, a seven-year-old could order a fully automatic machine gun from the Sears catalog, no questions asked, and we had no school shootings. Obviously, the problem is not the accessibility of firearms, right? The problem is what the public schools are force-feeding to our children, and I'm going to show you what that is. Uh, before we do, I do want to point out that they're preparing them for something, okay? This is not an accident. It's not just we woke up one day and suddenly we decided we would dumb down our kids and indoctrinate our kids. There's an agenda here. And because I don't want anybody to have to take my word for anything, that's why I bring these videos, because I know some of this stuff is just so incredible. But I want to let these people speak for themselves. They'll tell you what they're preparing your children for. Listen to this. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founder. Yeah, so credible United Nations are going to use their peacekeeping role, by which he means their military forces, the child raping lunatics who have been caught all over the world, 60,000 women and children raped by UN troops just in the last 10 years. According to the group here, their cries, that's based on UN data. They're going to use their peacekeeping troops to enforce the vision of the UN's founders. Well, isn't that cute? On one side of the table, you had Joseph Stalin, one of the worst butchers to ever walk on this planet. And then on our side of the table, we sent this guy, Alger Hiss. And boy, did they love him. That should have been our first clue that something was wrong. Right? Uh, he, they made him the first secretary general of the United Nations. He was the chairman of the conference that wrote the UN Charter. And then we put him in federal prison because he was a spy of the aforementioned butcher. Okay, he was working for Joseph Stalin. So why would we want to give up the beautiful vision of our founding fathers, the idea that all men are created equal, the idea that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that we institute government to protect that for the vision of a bunch of mass-murdering gangsters? Somebody should have asked Bush. Okay? But it's not just Bush. It's not just a Republican problem. Uh, here is the Communist Party candidate for the 2020. The task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create... Uh, uh, a new world order. Yeah, new world order. And this has been going on for a while, right? Here's another Democrat. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. Yeah, so they all agree they need a new world order, right? When Bill Clinton's not hanging out on Pedophile Island with his buddy Jeffrey Epstein, who, by the way, didn't commit suicide, this is what they're doing. They're planning for the new world order. And what do they mean by New World Order? Well, George Bush told us, right? Uh, and actually, they tell us in their own documents. I'm going to walk through a couple of them. And the reason why I'm showing you these documents is because they're just so honest about what they're doing. That's the amazing thing. Sure, they won't tell you on CNN. They won't tell you in the Washington Compost. But they'll tell you in the documents. And if you want to understand it, I mean, you can connect it all right back to this. 
everything God teaches us in his word, you flip it exactly upside down, and then you understand what they're teaching our children and where they're going with their agenda. So God told us that in the beginning he created. They tell, oh, there's no God. You just came from slime. God told us that he created male and female. Oh, that's bigotry. Now we know there's infinite genders. God told us that marriage is between a man and a woman. Oh, no, that's old-fashioned bigotry. Today we can have like five guys, three girls, two transgenders, and a cat. That'll be a marriage, right? Um, We know that God ordained private property. God said, thou shalt not steal. We know that God told us not to covet. And so what do they do? They promote Marxism that would completely abolish private property and that exists on a foundation of covetousness. I want what you have, and I'll kill you to get it. Right? It's, God tells us don't murder. So they teach us that it, you have a, a right. They found it in the penumbras of the Constitution to murder your unborn children. Okay? God created the nations. So what do they tell us? Nations and borders are racist. Just every single thing God teaches us, flip it upside down and you'll understand where they're going. You can tie everything they're learning right back to that. Now, uh, they've got a couple of international agreements that are guiding this process, Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. Um, They'll tell you Agenda 21 is a conspiracy theory if you watch too much CNN. Watch this, though. I wonder if I ran out of battery. Oh, it went too far. Uh, The Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for global environmental action. HCON Res 353 outlines a comprehensive national strategy for sustainable development in accordance with the principles of Agenda 21 to be coordinated under the leadership of a specific... So a national plan, actually they they summarized Agenda 21 for us, the people who wrote it. They said it's an array of actions intended to be implemented by every person on the planet. No exceptions, right? They said that it's going to require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. They have really big plans, right? Uh, And I was going to show you the video of Bush, but we skipped through it accidentally. He's the one who signed it back in 1992. Uh, Every government in the world signed on to this, and they've been implementing it. Bill Clinton issued an executive order requiring every federal agency to implement this. And you're thinking, how are they ever going to do that? How, How are they going to completely reorient all of human civilization. Well, you know, Obama called you guys bitter clingers, right? You guys are the ones who bitterly cling to your guns and your Bibles. Well, they know that. And so they know the path to making this happen runs right through your children and right through the public school system. So they tell you in chapter 36 of the international document, you can read it on the UN's website, education is critical for promoting the subversive ideology of sustainable development. They say formal and non-formal education are gonna be indispensable to changing people's attitudes. There's their strategy. It's indispensable. You wanna make this happen, you gotta brainwash the kids. Okay, they tell you that uh, it's gonna be critical to change the attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior of the children. Uh, It's even gotta include spiritual development, and we'll come back to that before we finish today because that's really, really significant. Now, what does it look like in the classroom? This is a, a book that the United Nations produced. It's called Rescue Mission, Planet Earth, a children's edition of Agenda 21. Doesn't that sound so cute? You should read it. I have one in my office. Uh, my friend Pat Markham gave it to me. And uh, this is one page I just chose, but there's, I mean, the whole thing is packed with evil. But you, maybe you can't see. It's got the Hindu gods. They're sitting up there on a cloud, and they're very upset and distraught because uh, the storks are delivering all these babies. Now, what does God tell us about babies? They're a blessing. They're a heritage from the Lord. God says we should be fruitful and multiply. And so naturally in the schools, they now teach the children that, and I quote from the book, the earth groans every time it registers another birth. It's right in the book. It's what they're teaching the children. Don't have children. Children are bad. Mother Earth is crying every time you have a baby. Global warming. Okay, that's what they're teaching your kids. And so many parents out there wondering, when am I ever going to get grandparents? You know, my daughter's like 40, 45. I don't have any grandbabies yet. What happened? This is what happened. They brainwashed your kids. Okay. Uh, this was, I went down to Rio in uh, 2012, 20 years after they signed the... Um, the Agenda 21, they had the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, and they had conscripted a bunch of little kids to make these posters. Uh, You can probably see it's got the uh, the doctor and the earth, and the earth is very sick, and he's got the thermometer, and the doctor diagnoses the problem. 
you have humans, okay, humans. You guys are the disease on this planet. But fortunately, the dictators club that is the United Nations will save us from this scourge. Now, Agenda 2030, they signed this in 2015. Uh, thank you, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, the communist Chinese loved it. As soon as it was signed, they, they bragged in all their propaganda machines. Oh, we played a crucial role in developing this. Uh, the, the dictator of Zimbabwe, the mass murdering Marxist, um, passed away now after a coup. Uh, he said, oh, this is gonna usher in this wonderful, brave new world. And what they say in the document, it's very short, you can read it. It says, children, your children, are critical agents of change. They're going to use these new goals to create a better world. And isn't that cute? Because we all want a better world, right? But what do they mean by better world? Well, we don't have to speculate because they tell us. In goal number 10, uh, national socialism, Hitler's idea, apparently was not enough. Now we need international socialism. Say so we've got to reduce inequality within and among countries. It's only going to be possible if we share the wealth. Right? Does that sound like Mugabe? Does that sound like Castro? Does that sound like Mao? Does that sound like Lenin? It's exactly the same language that they used. And what happened? Did we have a nice, wonderful utopia where everybody was happy and sharing and unicorns and rainbows? No, right? We had mass death. We had hundreds of millions of people slaughtered, starved to death, dying from shortages of basic medicine. That's what awaits us if these people get their way. Then you go to goal four, and again, they tell you how they're going to do it. By 2030, every one of your children needs to be so brainwashed, they won't just passively submit to this agenda, they will promote it. Okay, that's the word they use. And, and gender equality, which means radical feminism, destroy the family, and human rights, which means the UN's version of human rights, exactly the opposite of what our founders meant when they said God-given rights, right? And you can read the thing, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 29, none of these rights and privileges may ever be used contrary to the purposes and principles of the UN. And if your kids don't like it, then they are not uh, in compliance with all this, right? To get a sense of how big it is, the guy who was leading the UN General Assembly when they adopted this said it was the new master plan for humanity. Uh, the head of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, said this was the global declaration of interdependence. And they knew exactly what they were saying, right? Here's a video they produced to emphasize how important education is to bringing this about. We achieve sustainable development that protects our planet and builds a more inclusive, equal, and peaceful world without education. We can't. Sustainable development begins with education. Put global education first. Sustainable development begins with education. Are you starting to see the picture? This is them. This is a UNESCO video. This isn't me telling you this. This is them telling you. And they've got a lot of practice on this, by the way. They've been studying this for a century. Okay, all, Pavlov, all these uh, psychologists, all this quackery, they had a purpose in mind. Now, I want to show you how this works because they've done it on many occasions. They are very effective at completely changing society through the public school system. So in the early 1990s, uh, I, I would have been, if I'd lived in America, I would have been subjected to this. This was shown to first grade, second grade, and third grade children in 1991, 1992, and 1993. It was a documentary produced by some homosexuals called It's Elementary, talking about gay issues at school. Now, if you were around in the early 1990s, you probably remember that sodomy was still a crime, right? The Supreme Court didn't strike down our sodomy laws until 2000, okay? And yet, they were going for the children. Watch this video that they showed to little kids all over this country in public schools. Um, let me tell you quickly the background. Today, the law says that um, if you're the same sex, two men and two women, you can't get married. It is against the law. And I thought that it might be kind of fun for us to sort of be pretend ju judges for a few minutes. Pretend what I'm going to give each of you is a sheet that just tells you that um, some people think that it's wrong for gays to get married, that it's not natural, and that it goes against what a family is. Other people think that the state should not decide these things, that it should just be up to two adults to decide what they want to do. So anyway, it goes on, but you get the point, right? Let's be pretend judges. And then there's those mean old people who don't think people who love each other should be able to get married. And then there's us wonderful, nice homosexuals who think that anyone who loves each other should be able to get married. Well, they asked the people of California at the ballot box, no thanks, we're fine with God's definition of marriage, even in the land of fruits and nuts, right? But they knew they had already prepared an entire generation of young Americans so that the pretend judges on our Supreme Court could strike down our marriage laws across all 50 states, and then they lit up our White House in rainbow colors. Now here's today, right? Portland Public Schools marching. They're so proud of their uh, sodomy. Uh, here the children are obviously on a field trip learning some great things at pride parades, right? I'm almost embarrassed to show that. Now. What are they teaching the kids today? Right? What are they preparing the kids for today? And this is going to sound totally crazy to people who maybe went to school prior to like the 2000s, okay? Because um, we all learned that carbon dioxide is the gas of life, 
right? Humans exhale about two pounds of it every day. Uh, plants use it to do photosynthesis. And in fact, the Earth is starving for more CO2. I've interviewed dozens of the top scientists in the world, including many who work for the UN. They say, oh, the Earth is starving for more CO2. That's why farmers pump it into their greenhouses. It makes the plants grow better. Well, they're teaching the children in government schools all over this country and all over the world that carbon dioxide, the gas you exhale, is actually a toxic pollution that's going to kill us all unless we let the UN tax and regulate everything that produces CO2. And now, from a scientific perspective, it's completely ludicrous. It's idiotic beyond description. But from a totalitarian perspective, it is brilliant because there's nothing that any person can do Nothing. I mean nothing. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You can't die without CO2 coming out. From a totalitarian perspective, this is brilliant because you can control and tax everything. Okay? Here's what it looks like. We hope that as video. many schools as possible will follow examples like this and we will support them in their efforts. Education is a powerful tool to address climate change and to ensure that the rights and needs of people today and tomorrow yeah, education to address He's climate hurt. change, right? And I want to show you this video of what it looks like um, in a public school in America. Uh-oh. Went past it, sorry. But yeah, these are public schools in America that I want you to see. You've yeah. heard the reports. The globe's warming. It's our fault. And the consequences will be terrible. Children are frightened. I worry. My mom worries. The water might rise and it might flood the whole town. We won't be able to survive for long. What are you most worried will happen? We'll all die. Are there some people who say this isn't true? Yes. 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 Might they be right? No. How do you know they're not right? Well, because the earth is getting hotter. Where do you learn this? Can't you see? School in my state of Florida. Looks more like a doomsday cult, but you know. Whatever you do, don't drink the Kool-Aid. One of the main components so after they brainwash them and then a letter for their congressman. Of global warming is that they're given a letter for their families to sign and it's this is the congressman or So you brainwash them and then you get them politically Congress active, right? Um, and here they are standing on the steps of the legislature demanding more climate legislation and more restrictions on the gas of life. Now, Charlotte Iserbit, uh, I just went to go visit her last weekend. She was uh, Ronald Reagan's senior advisor on education policy, amazing lady. And when she got to the Department of Education, she saw all these documents. She's like, oh my goodness, they're, they're turning America's education system into a replica of the Soviet system. That's a terrible idea. So she starts leaking these documents. Uh, obviously, the uh, powers that be were not pleased. But here's what she says is actually happening in education. You think the purpose of education is reading, writing, and arithmetic? The purpose of education is to change the thoughts, actions, and feelings of students. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Now here it is from a lady who was involved in writing national standards before most of us even knew we were going to have national standards. So here she is speaking to the National Governors Association in 1989, talking about uh, what's happening in America and in the school system. Fix and fix up these schools and taking care of them. Rather than the issue of understanding that what we're into is a total restructuring of the society. Total restructuring of the society. Now watch the role of the schools. She's proud of it. The other function of schools, which sounds paradoxical and yet in a sense is really not, is the fact that we have to prepare students not for today's society, but for a society that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. And so we have to anticipate what the future is and then move back they use a crystal ball and figure for that, out right? what it is we need to do today. That's called anticipatory socialization or the social change function of school. Social change function of schools. How many parents who send their children to school every day do you think know there's a social change function to the schools? That they're bringing about a complete transformation, a total restructuring of our society. My guess is not a lot. Right? And actually, if you dig into this woman's background, it gets really weird. And you'll see this pattern comes up over and over again. She uh, co-wrote this book, uh, The Light Shall Set You Free. She was in communication with these spiritual entities that she described as ascended masters. If you've been reading your Bible, you know they're not ascended anything, okay? Um, quite the opposite. But uh, it gets really weird, and we'll come back to that later. Now, this total transformation, this total restructuring of our society, what does it look like? Well, I'll give you some anecdotes, and you can put the, the dots together. 
in Florida. Uh, they decided that uh, we needed uh, girls to be able to go change and shower in the boys' locker room. A little girl decided she was a boy. Um, and so the school administration, instead of maybe trying to get some help for her, talking to her parents, they said, oh, just go in there and change with the boys. And they ordered the male PE teacher to go in and supervise all this. I can't go in there and watch a, you know, an underage 14-year-old girl get naked. That's crazy. That was a crime last week. I mean, I would have gone to jail. What are you guys talking about? So they, they actually got the emails later. They were going to make an example of him. They weren't just going to fire him. They wanted to take away his teaching credential so he could never teach again, so that he would serve as an example to teachers everywhere. You comply or it's all over for you. In Minnesota, they got even bolder. You remember the equal partner thing? Uh, his little boy decided he was actually a girl. A mom, dad, can I have a sex change? <laughs> no, that's crazy. Get on the school bus, please. Uh, well, the other partner knew better, so they took this child to a medical facility to have his genitals surgically removed as part of what they called a sex change surgery. Okay? This is happening. This is now in America. In fact, this was last year. There's a federal lawsuit about it, but it's too late, right? You can't reattach the missing pieces parts. Uh, in California, they just throw it right, at, right up there on the Department of Education website. They've got a gender transition plan and an individual support plan. And so the student fills this out with the teacher. Do your parents know? Okay, well, then we'll keep it secret from them. How soon do you want to begin your puberty blockers? How soon should we start injecting you with testosterone? When should we get you ready for your surgery? All behind your parents' back, mind you. Right? Ten years ago, you couldn't get an aspirin for your students without asking parents' permission. Now, they can take you to have permanent sterilizing mutilation surgery behind your back, okay? And this is on their website. You can read these documents for yourself. Uh, Five-year-old children in California under the health education frameworks is one of the books they were recommending. Who are you? There's infinite genders the kids can choose from. They give them 15 to choose from uh, as examples. They got agender, bigender, trigender, neutral, free spirit, weird things I can't even pronounce. Uh, obviously, this is um, a man in a dress with some demon horns so you would know where it came from, right, straight from the pit of hell, uh, reading stories to little children. They call it the Drag Queen Story Hour. And they go to public schools all over America, kindergartens, first grade, third grade. They read these horrible stories to these children trying to normalize perversion. Um, you've got, uh, this, this is from the NEA that uh, Rebecca was talking about earlier. Um, watch this. this is a, they formed a partnership with the Human Rights Campaign, a, a radical organization that wants to shut down your church and throw you in jail if you won't agree and bow the knee to their crazy ideology, to their uh, false idols. This is a video they sent out as part of their partnership to teachers all over America. Watch this. Hi, your name is Emma, yes. correct? And my name is Zim. What pronouns do you use? I use she, they, them. Cool, cool, what cool. pronouns do you use? I use they, them, and also just Z. And so instead of being a boy or a girl or something undefined or in the middle, I kind of like, just use my name. You know, my name is Zim. So if you just use Z instead of a pronoun, it's like more personalized and like less fitting into a binary. Yeah. Yeah. And you keep going, and then the one says, like, do you ever have to, like, educate um, teachers about, you know, your, your gender stuff and your pronouns? And the guy said, oh, no. No, yeah, every once in a while I have a substitute teacher or something. But no, no, all the teachers know, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, this is, and, and it's working. It's working really, really well, okay? This is very effective. When I was a kid, uh, not that long ago, uh, and, I, and I lived in eight countries on four continents, I grew up with kids from every possible background you could imagine, Hindus, Buddhists, Shintos, from everywhere, right? Africans, Indians, uh, Asians, Mexicans, Brazilians, from everywhere. Never once, out of all the thousands of kids I met in my life, never once did I meet a boy who thought he was a girl or a girl who thought she was a boy. It just would have been inconceivable. In fact, the word transgender wasn't even in the dictionary when I was a kid. And now, according to this study out of the UCLA in California, 27% of California's children, 27%, more than one out of four, and this was last year, uh, are now uh, gender nonconforming. So boys who don't accept their boys, girls who don't accept that they're girls. Right? At what point do we say, stop? Do we wait until it's 50% or 75%? You think they're going to have a lot of kids? You think our civilization is going to continue if this continues this way? I can assure you that it won't. And people say, oh, I live in a conservative state. That, that's not going to affect me. I, I'm in Utah. I'm in South Carolina. I don't have to worry about that. Well, I was in Utah right before the corona craziness hit. And um, I, I was, had some meetings with some education officials there, people on the boards and stuff like that. And uh, I found out, this is data that they gave me, there has been a 10,000% increase in the number of minor girls who are transitioning to a new gender. 10,000% in five years. From 2015 to 2020, there was a 10,000% increase in the amount of little girls becoming a new gender, okay? 
Uh, and that's in Utah, one of the most conservative states in America. And it gets even sicker. Uh, this was sent to me by a mother in California who now leads a, a wonderful organization, Foreign Parents of California. Uh, she got, in California, they passed this LGBT mandate where all the kids had to learn LGBT stuff constantly in history and everything else. And so I actually got the curriculum that they were using in this district. They, you know, first they teach about Harvey Milk, oh, how wonderful, a hero of the LGBT movement. No mention of the fact that he was a child rapist and that some of his victims committed suicide. Don't want to tell the kids that, because, I mean, Obama named a Navy ship after him. Pfft, can't tell the kids that. Uh, and then he was murdered by a Democrat. Fun fact, but it's true. Um, well, after Harvey Milk, they get into the older history of the LGBT movement. They go to ancient Greece, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, men used to have lots of sex with boys. Hmm? And this mom, she goes and she talks to the assistant superintendent of curricula. Uh, her name is Ke uh, Carrie Torres. Why are you teaching my kids pedophilia? And not like, oh, we would never do that. That's horrifying. Where would you get such an idea? Watch what she says. It's a sexual orientation that's existed in history. It's really important. We have to teach it to them, right? Well, a lot of people don't realize there's now 26 states, including California, where it is against the law to, quote, unquote, discriminate against someone due to their sexual orientation. And they are teaching children in California and other places that raping children is a sexual orientation. So we know that it would be insane to hire a pedophile to run your Sunday school or your school. But what's going to happen when these kids grow up? How dare you discriminate? That's just a sexual orientation. It's against the law. You can't do that. That's what they're preparing the children for. And there's a pattern, right? There's a picture somebody snapped in a classroom in California. You see pedophilia as sexual orientation. That's where they're going, folks. It gets sicker and sicker. And it all goes back to this guy. You know, why do they have to sexualize the children? Why do they start in kindergarten teaching the kids all these horrors? Well, it all goes back to this man here, Alfred Kinsey a sicko of the highest order. Uh, he was a child rapist, and he was responsible for the rape and sexual torture of hundreds, maybe thousands of little kids. And he documented it all meticulously. You can read his so-called research. They were raping five-month-old babies. They were raping four-year-old boys and, uh, under the guise of science. And they'd say, oh, look, they're screaming, and they're hollering, and they're crying, and they're passing out. They're climaxing. They're having an orgasm. That means children are sexual beings from birth. And so we have to get them as early as possible into sex education classes. And all of you are probably thinking, that's the sickest thing I've ever heard. It is. And that's the foundation of sex education in schools in America and all over the world. This guy's so-called sex research. Okay, Beyond sick. Now, Obama, of course, uh, pushed the common core on us. And again... There is no education going on in the school system. And uh, parents are so confused. They think their kids are getting an education. Uh, they put two subject matter experts on the Common Core Validation Committee, and only two. One of them is uh, Dr. Sandra Stotsky. And um, they asked them to look at these standards and certify that they were acceptable, that they were okay. And these are people who agree with the, uh, the idea of national standards, who weren't opposed to that. Well, Dr. Sandra Stotsky said, no way. This is going to reduce the critical thinking abilities of children. These were written hastily by people who didn't care how terrible they were. And they're taking out all the great literature and they're replacing it with Obama's executive orders and EPA regulations on roof insulation. Even if the kid could read, who in the world would want to read EPA regulations on roof insulation? It's absurd. So no, she refused to sign off on it. They just took her name off the website, pretended she didn't exist. Then you had this guy here, Dr. James Milgram, mathematician from Stanford University. He said, no, I won't sign off on the standards. He said they are written to reflect very low expectations. They're as non-challenging as possible with extremely serious failings. There are actual errors in the math, okay? They're neither mathematically correct nor especially clear. And so obviously we should mandate them in all 50 states so that we can have a nation of children who don't know how to do anything, right? You wonder why the kid at McDonald's can't count your change. Now you know. Right? And in, now in Seattle, I don't know if you guys heard, math is officially racist, okay? So I don't know how we build bridges without math, but that'll be fun. Uh, now, the federal government knows the Common Core is dumbing down our children on a massive scale. They funded a study from CSAIL. They found that it had significant negative effects during the seven years after it was implemented, and the magnitude of these negative effects is getting worse over time. Okay, our children are getting dumber and they know it. We've got the next generation pseudoscience standards, 12 years. Of, this is like the common core of science written by the same people, by the way, Achieve Inc. Um, and 
you can study 12 years, fake science, you will never learn the term, the scientific method. What you will learn at every single stage is humans' emissions of CO2 are causing catastrophic climate change and we're all going to die unless we let the UN tax and regulate us. And you came from slime over billions of years and there is no God and somehow you came from a monkey. Okay? As long as you agree with those things, we'll call you a scientist, even if you don't know anything else. Uh, and that's how crazy it is. Now, the fake history is just as bad, right? They're teaching the kids that America invented slavery. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Duke Pesta, who worked with us on this Rescuing Our Children project, he uh, gives a, a survey to his incoming, he's a university professor, surveys his incoming students. It used to be half of them thought that America invented slavery. Now, he says over 80% of his incoming students believe that America invented slavery. Obviously, they haven't read the Bible, or they'd know something, right? Uh, I mean, the Jews were slaves in Egypt, right? We all remember that. Uh, slavery has been a scourge that has afflicted humanity from the beginning, in almost every culture, almost every civilization. And then along come these guys, and they looked at the Bible, and they said, wait a minute, this is not right. God created us equally, and God endowed us all with inalienable rights. And within 100 years, we ended slavery not just here, but all over the world. And it took a long time. You could still buy and sell slaves legally in Mauritania until 2007, but... In America and countries under the influence of America, we banned that. And instead, you have our kids thinking that America invented slavery. Okay, that's how crazy it is. They don't learn anything about the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. The Second Amendment, so the government can have a militia. Um, Trump is a racist extremist. This is what they're teaching in Common Core Line textbooks and advanced placement history books. Right? Trump was a racist. His supporters were all a bunch of racists. Here they are bowing down to Allah on a field trip. Here's a classroom in uh, Wichita. Uh, they got the five pillars of Islam, right? They've got the kids writing out the Islamic Shahada, the conversion prayer. Um, can't mention the Ten Commandments, though, but we will teach them that. This is a U.S. Department of Education-funded study on how we get rid of Christian privilege in the schools. And one of the ways, and you're probably wondering what Christian privilege, right? Um, but one of the ways was to infuse the curriculum with Islamic thought, funded by your tax dollars. Um, they're doing Buddhism in the classroom. They call it mindfulness education, and the people who do this will tell you it's Buddhism. Right? They do yoga in the classroom, which is, of course, Hinduism. So you can do any false religion you want unless it comes from the Bible, in which case it's banned separation of church and state. And that's where they're going. And if you're Christian in North Carolina, they actually made the little kids come to the front of the class and apologize for their Christian privilege. Right? Can you imagine what those poor little kids felt like? I'm sorry for my Christian privilege. Right? These poor little kids. Um, now, they're gathering more data on your children than you could even begin to imagine. They know more about them than you do. They have hundreds of data points on every child going through the public school system. They know about their dental health, their mental health, their nutrition. They give them surveys. How does your dad talk to mom? What kind of food do you have in your refrigerator? Does anybody drink in your house? How many people smoke in your house? They know everything about you and your family. And they've, they're gathering it for a specific purpose. Right? That, that last slide right there, I pulled that right out of the of Department of Education report. They've got a facial expression camera that monitors the facial expression that children make as they're exposed to different stimuli. So maybe a guy comes in with some demon horns to read some LGBT stories and your kid makes a face. Say, uh-oh, this one needs an intervention. You gotta circle back, make sure he gets the right attitudes. Right? That's where they're going with this. Uh, and then they tell you in another Department of Education report, this is a copy right out of the report, they're using all this data so that they can predict the future interests and behavior of your children. Okay? This is central planning on steroids. Oh, he's a conservative Christian? Oh, you definitely cannot go into law. You definitely cannot go into teaching or journalism, right? Because you might influence somebody. I don't know, can't have that. Okay, they've got values clarification. This one makes me sick to even talk about it. And I remember going through it when I was a kid. Uh, probably you guys do too if you went to school after like the mid-1960s. And uh, this is a handbook that UNESCO produced. They want it all over the world. And you know, the one they gave to me, I'm, I'm sure some of you guys remember similar stuff if you're a little bit uh, older. But they told me, so you're on a ship and your ship is sinking. Ten of you pile onto this life raft. And um, the life raft only has a capacity to hold nine of you. So you got to get rid of someone, and you got a doctor, and you got a teacher, and you got a lawyer, and who are you going to kill? Who are you going to murder so that the rest of you can survive? It's for the greater good, after all. And you guys already all know the answer. It's lawyer, right, obviously. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. There's great, great lawyers out there, we know. Um, but, you know, what happens in the minds of the kids? Well, my parents taught me we shouldn't murder, and the pastor said we shouldn't murder, and God's Ten Commandments said we shouldn't murder. But obviously, the only moral solution to this problem is for us to murder someone. It's for the greater good. And so what happens? The children's belief in absolute morality and absolute right and wrong is smashed into a million pieces. That's why one of these guys bragged that they could undo what parents had done over 15 years in an hour. Right? They have this psychological research behind them. They know that all the values parents tried to instill in their children over 15 years can be smashed just with a little exercise like that. 
because morality is relative. Maybe there is a time and a place to put uh, people in concentration camps or to get rid of older people or to kill unborn babies. Morality is relative. It's about the greater good. Maybe there is a time and a place for that, right? That's what happens in the minds of the children. And if they had actually been doing some critical thinking, they would have said, well, wait a minute here. Why don't we just take turns? I'll swim for an hour, and then you swim for an hour, and then we don't have to kill anybody. I mean, that would be sensible, right? But they're not supposed to think in those terms. They have to think in terms of who do we murder. That's the appropriate response. Now, again, back to this education thing. There is no education going on in the schools, and you don't have to take my word for it. The government will proudly tell you that your kids are as dumb as a box of rocks, and I don't mean to sound mean or judgmental, but listen, this is the Deputy Secretary of Education talking about the national scores of our children. assessment of educational progress, the NAEP, which is called America's Report Card, reports that two-thirds, get this, two-thirds of American eighth graders are not proficient in any core subject. All right, two-thirds of America's eighth graders are not proficient in any core subject. Could we have a refund, please? Right, we spent $12,000 to $20,000 per child per year for at least eight years, maybe 10 if you include kindergarten, and they're not proficient in anything, nothing, not even like drawing, they're not in proficient in anything, but that's what our own government is telling us. Okay, why don't we get a reba? Can you imagine if a businessman said, I'm gonna sell you a product that does X and it did the opposite of X? You'd take them to court and you'd sue them and you'd say, give me back my money. And yet the public schools say, oh, you just need to give us more money. That's the problem. We just need more money. They always need more money. And your kids are still as dumb as a box of rocks. In fact, they've never been dumber than they are today. And that's just the truth. And that's what the government's numbers show. Even back in the 80s, before I was born, Ronald Reagan put together a commission, the National Commission on Excellence in Education. They said the very future of our nation, our future as a people, is under threat as a result of this so-called education system. They said if a foreign power had imposed it on us, we would have viewed it as an act of war. And we should view it as an act of war. It was. Okay? Um, Americans were once the most highly educated people on this planet. John Adams wrote in a letter to a friend that a native of America who can't read or write is as rare as a comet or an earthquake. Okay, you might see one every great once in a while, but it's like, whoa, look at that, a comet. Everybody would be astounded. Right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson used to brag that American farmers were the only ones in the world who read Homer. This was all before we had a government education system. Fancy that. Read the Federalist Papers. Go read them today. Go find yourself some college kids. Say, hey, read these. Huh? I don't get it. <laughs> no idea. Okay? And yet these were written for average Americans. These were written for farmers and blacksmiths and shopkeepers, not for PhDs in political science. Okay, um, there was a lot of data on this as well. DuPont de Nemours did a study in 1812, uh, National Education in the United States of America. He said most Americans can read, write, and cipher, do math. Not more than four in a thousand are unable to write legibly, even neatly. If you look at the government's numbers for today, almost half of us are functionally illiterate or so close to it that we might as well lump them together in the same category. Why? Why were Americans so educated back then and why are they so dumb today? I love this law. This was actually the first education law passed in North America. It was uh, up in the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. And they passed this law, and it was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And they said one of the chief projects of that Old Deluder Satan is to deny men knowledge of the scriptures. And so we need to make sure everybody in our colony can read. Hmm, interesting, <laughs> right? You wonder, why can't half of Americans read today? I submit to you that this probably has something to do with it, right? There's somebody who doesn't want our children reading the scriptures. Okay? And they were very deliberate about this. Now, I'll give you a very condensed history of the public school system because uh, a lot of people just, I mean, it's just like as American as apple pie. We've always had public school. What would we do without public school? How would children get educated if the government didn't do it for us? Well, this is a relatively new idea. And in fact, it was incredibly radical less than 200 years ago. This guy here, Robert Owen, is the first guy we can find, you know, other than uh, Plato, the totalitarian who wanted philosopher kings to run your life. Um, Robert Owen was a communist before Karl Marx. He set up this ridiculous colony in Indiana called New Harmony. Total failure. After two years, the thing collapsed because communism is ridiculous, because it violates every precept that God has revealed to us in his word. And yet, he got the wrong idea. The colony didn't fail because communism is ridiculous. The colony failed because the children were too selfish and they hadn't been brainwashed to believe in collectivism and communism. 
So uh, he wrote these essays. Actually, uh, the ambassador to Prussia got a hold of these essays and took them back to Prussia. And the Prussian dictator said, ooh, I like that idea. I could mold the minds of the children in my principality. Let's do that. Now, uh, education or, uh, Interior minister, set me up a school system and tell parents they better send their children here right away. Now, in America, it took a long time for this idea to catch on. Robert Owen was rather impatient. So he created a secret society. And we know about it because this guy here blew the whistle, Orestes Brownson. He was part of the secret society. He said it was modeled on the Carbonari of Europe. And the goal was to influence public opinion and to get men elected to the legislatures who would be in favor of having the government educate children. Okay, which at the time was pretty much inconceivable. Uh, there was a few towns that had you know, public schools, but they were nothing like what he was talking about. Then Horace Mann came along, and he looked at Prussia, and he said, ooh, that Prussian idea of government schools, let's do that in Massachusetts. So he got himself selected as the first ever in all of American history Secretary of Education for a state, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's called the father of American public education. He rejected the Bible, which at the time was like, what do you mean, education without the Bible? That's like the dumbest thing I ever heard of. That's not even possible. So he had to be quiet about it, but he said, we, under the guise of um, getting rid of sectarianism in the schools, we've got to get rid of the Bible. He actually went to Prussia, and he loved what the Prussian dictator was doing. Uh, he wanted public schools to equalize all men. So a little socialist in the making wanted the Bible out. And uh, one of the most destructive things he did was introduce this thing called the whole word method of teaching reading. It was developed by a reverend who was teaching deaf children. So it was really a great idea. Deaf children can't hear sounds. And so if you tell them that a T makes a T sound, that doesn't mean much to a deaf child. So they said, why don't we just teach them to read the whole word as if the word itself were a symbol? So when you see these squiggly lines, that means cat, not k a uh, t and sound it out. And so for deaf children, this was remarkable. It was a great leap forward, uh, no pun intended, in terms of being able to educate deaf children. But Horace Mann brought this into the public schools that he had created in Boston. And it was such a disaster, it only took a few years for all the schoolmasters, 38 of them, I believe, they put together an essay completely debunking this ridiculous idea. Uh, they wrote, you know, they were very uh, proper back then, but they wrote that this change proposed by Mr. Mann is neither called for nor sustained by sound reasoning. And you should read the essay. Actually, uh, Sam Blumenfeld, my friend and late colleague, uh, republished it in his book, um, The New Illiterates. So you can read that essay there. It's brilliant. It's a total takedown of the whole word method of teaching reading. Well, we didn't hear about it again for another 50 years until this guy came along, John Dewey, a socialist. Rather than looking to Prussia, he looked to the Soviet Union for his inspiration. He actually went there. He wrote all these essays about how wonderful education was in the Soviet Union. They're instilling a collectivistic mentality in all the children. Isn't that great? Now, he wrote an essay called... Uh, the primary education fetish, and Sam and I, Dr. Blumenfeld, reprinted it in our book, Crimes of the Educators. I've got a few copies if you want to see them. Uh, and he wrote in this essay, change must come gradually. To force it unduly would compromise its final success by favoring a violent reaction. So he knew we've got to make these changes slowly or parents and teachers will absolutely lose their minds and our whole plan will be in ruins. So uh, he went over and got a, a nice fancy position at the University of Chicago. The Rockefellers gave him $3 million to set up an experimental school, graduated a bunch of kids who couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't tell right from wrong, and they said, aha, that's perfect. Let's do that nationwide. So he went over to Columbia University, took up a spot at the Teachers College, the most prestigious teacher college in all the world to this day, and started training up an army of little minions to go out across America and brainwash teachers and brainwash students. Uh, he resurrected the whole word method. And then it really took off after World War II, because after World War II, all these school districts had all this money. They said, oh, let's buy all these new fancy-schmancy textbooks coming out of Columbia University. And John Dewey had prepared these. Now, in 1955, Rudolf Flesch blew the whistle on this. He said the teaching of reading all over the United States, in all the schools and in all the textbooks, is totally wrong and flies in the face of all logic and common sense. And that's putting it mildly, right? The same thing that the schoolmasters in Boston figured out in the 1840s, Rudolf Flesch had figured out in the 1950s. Okay, anybody who thinks that uh, Dewey didn't know what he was doing, uh, I've got some nice beachfront property in Nebraska. See me after. Uh, now, now we have uh, brain scans. Okay, there's a doctor over in France, Dr. Stanislas Dahane, who's been doing brain scans on children, and he's been comparing the brains of children who learned how to read with phonics versus the brains of children who've learned with this quackery. What he found was that you can actually see the brain damage in the minds of the children who've been exposed to this quackery, the whole words. They get them memorizing entire words. It says the brain gets wired wrong. That's why they can't read. That's why they hate reading. And so at this point, you probably won't be surprised to know that whole words are mandatory under Common Core. Starting in kindergarten, you start memorizing sight words. And, and then they say, oh, but we teach phonics too. 
Yeah, after you scrambled their brains by teaching them a bunch of sight words and you developed a sight word reflex. Okay? That's why 50% of American adults struggle with reading. Okay, now UNESCO, the UN Education Agency, wants it taught all over the world. And I want to spend just a minute also on John Dewey's religion, because you can't understand the public education system today unless you understand the religious views of the man who created it. Now, um, we don't have to speculate about his religious views, because he very kindly left an enormous paper trail for us to follow. Now, he wrote the Humanist Manifesto. He co-wrote the Humanist Manifesto with a bunch of other humanists. And the very first tenet gives you everything you need to know. He says, we religious humanists believe that the universe is self-existing and not created. And those of you who've read the very first page of your Bible are probably thinking, wait a minute. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So right off the bat, they're telling you that, that God stuff, that's silly. Right? Uh, the second one, we believe in evolution. And you read the rest of it, it's just warmed over communism. Right? Got to get rid of the profit motive. Got to have equitable distribution of the means of life. Now, even if you're not a Bible-believing Christian, and I think you should believe the Bible because it's true, but even if you're not, this has very, very important implications to you and to our country. Okay? Our founding fathers didn't think it was a religious statement to say that you were created by God who gave you rights. They said it was a self-evident truth. Okay, it's not even something you debate. It's just so obvious. As God says in Romans 1, he made it plain. His attributes are plain to see. You have to deliberately suppress the truth in your unrighteousness. The founding fathers regarded this as a self-evident truth. But what happens if you believe John Dewey's religion? Well, you can't have God-given rights if there's no God, right? There is no God-given rights at all. Well, you have whatever rights the mob lets you have, and it'll be less and less and less. Now, one of his allies, one of the co-signers of this manifesto, C.F. Potter, he wrote in his book, Humanism, A New Religion, that education would be the way they would spread this religion. Five days a week? What's your Sunday school one hour a week going to do to counteract our five days of humanist instruction? Absolutely nothing, right? Absolutely nothing in most cases. Now, this is not a new religion. Uh, if you keep reading in Genesis, go to Genesis 3, 5, you'll see that uh, we have heard this lie before, the idea that man can be God, the idea that man can decide for himself what's right and wrong. Here you go. God knows that when you eat that fruit, then your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. You'll be able to decide for yourself what's right and wrong, right? This is a satanic lie from the pit of hell, and now it is the established religion of the United States. Thank you, Supreme Court. In 1962, they ruled that we couldn't have prayer in our schools, right? It was a non-sectarian prayer written by Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. God, we acknowledge you. We ask your blessings. Can't have that. Unconstitutional. 1963, can't have Bible reading in school anymore, right? Well, uh, at least one of the justices recognized what was going on here. You know, they, they cited the First Amendment. They said the First Amendment requires that. Well, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. The state of New York is not Congress. My local school district is not Congress. Okay? But uh, this justice here, Justice Potter Stewart, he knew what was happening. And he actually wrote in his dissent that what happened here was not the realization of a state of neutrality with respect to religion, but rather the establishment of a religion of secularism or humanism, as John Dewey would have called it. And this is now the official religion of the United States, taught to all of our children at taxpayer expense in every one of our schools. That's exactly what the founders wanted to prevent, right? The federal government forcing a religion and forcing us to support it with our tax dollars. Now, the idea that the First Amendment prohibited religion in school would have been absolutely ludicrous, right? Most of the states, when the First Amendment was written, actually had established churches. So obviously, the founders didn't mean to exclude any religion from any public body or any public function. But uh, what they did, the Supreme Court did, was exactly what the founders intended to prevent, right? But they said Congress. They never imagined in a million years that the Supreme Court would establish a religion, but they did. And uh, now we're close to the end of the presentation, but I want to show you this is now going global, right? The UN now has this master plan to brainwash all kids all over the world with the same garbage. Uh, after World War II, they set up UNESCO, the UN's education agency, and uh, they were very open right at the beginning, right? The guy who actually led it at first, Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brother, was the head of the Humanist Society. And he was the head of the Eugenics Society, these kooks who believed that certain races were superior. I mean, they believed Darwin's lies, that certain races were superior, that we should selectively breed people to get rid of, uh, as, as Margaret Sanger would have called them, human weeds. Okay, this is the first guy who ran UNESCO, a humanist who believed in scientific racism or pseudo-scientific racism. Now, if you read their documents, they said right at the beginning, we've got to get uh, God out of the schools. We've got to get the family influence out of the children's minds. And then in 1990, they got really bold. They got a, a global agreement on education called Education for All in Thailand. 
And they just came out and said it. All children should learn from the same standards, and it's now a responsibility of all humanity, right? It's a common responsibility to come up with these standards, not your school board, your family, your legislature, none of those things. Uh, in 2000, they came out completely out of the closet. They just said, hey, education's got to change the attitudes, values, and beliefs of your children. Directly in the text, right? No more beating around the bush, okay? Um, and they're very serious about this, right? Here's uh, the Secretary General of the UN in 2015 talking about what education should do. Education must do more than produce individuals who can read, write, and count. It must nurture global citizens who can rise to the challenges of the 21st century. All right, quick show of hands. How many people here sent their kids to school so they'd become good global citizens? Still none. Okay, so I, I, I've given this talk to many thousands of people, and never once has anyone said, I do, right? Because people don't send their children to school to become good global citizens, right? Far from it. But they're very bold now. In 2016, the UN had a global action plan, and they said now education needs to shape the spirituality of your children too. Uh, and they have a big plan. Uh, this was the head of UNESCO at the time, Irina Bokova. Uh, she's an actual member of the Bulgarian Communist Party. Her dad was on the Politburo. She served as a foreign minister to this mass murdering dictatorship. They slaughtered about 250,000 people out of a population of about 7 million, mostly Christians and people who didn't like communism. And she hates me with a passion, which just makes me smile from ear to ear. But... Um, a true story. She sent out this press release while she was running UNESCO, and she said, uh, we have the collective duty to make sure that all the children have the right values to shape the future as responsible global citizens. They're telling you to your face this is what they're doing. Okay, here's a UN video bragging about what they're doing. The Education 2030 Agenda is our roadmap to inclusive and quality education for all. UNESCO, the UN specialized agency for education, is leading the global and regional coordination of this ambitious goal, responding to cutting edge global challenges, supporting countries to build better education systems, and monitoring progress to make sure the world stays on course. They're helping countries to build better education systems and they're monitoring progress to make sure the world stays on course. And with that fancy British accent, I mean, how could you disagree? They sound so smart, right? Uh, incredible. But, I mean, they're not talking about America, right? I mean, they're, they're not going to help us build a better... They're not going to monitor our progress, are they? Oh, yes, they are, okay? You guys remember Arne Duncan from the beginning. Well, he spent seven years as Secretary of Education. He gave this speech to UNESCO in 2010. He said, you guys are our global partner in global education reform. He bragged that we're turning your children into green global citizens. He said we're infusing sustainability into every element of the curriculum. He quoted a communist terrorist, and I won't tell you which one because we'd need another presentation, but he said education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. How many of you guys knew education was a weapon? Right? And they're not kidding. It's a weapon, all right. They said it's a global public good, unconstrained by national boundaries. So we've got a global education system. And they're dead serious about this. Okay, this guy here on the screen is Robert Mueller. He was the Assistant um, Secretary General of the United Nations. And if you read his writings, he was a wackadoodle of the highest order. He said the UN was the body of Christ. Mm, okay. Uh, he also said that uh, we need to steer children toward this new order. And he wrote the UN's World Core Curriculum. And to his credit, he was pretty honest about what he was doing. You can go down to your local library, get a copy of the teacher's manual for the World Core Curriculum. And in the foreword, you'll find this, signed Robert Mueller. He said, the underlying philosophy, which this is based on, will be found in the books of Alice Bailey by the Tibetan teacher, Jival Kool. And to almost all people in America and around the world, that means nothing. Alice Bailey who, right? Well, everybody who runs the UN knows who she is. She actually designed their little prayer room. And I'll give you a hint. She founded the Lucifer Publishing Company. True story. Uh, and this Tibetan teacher that was referenced is not actually Tibetan, is not actually a teacher, and is not even a human being. Uh, he was an ascended master. Alice Bailey claimed to be in communication with these spiritual entities that she also described as ascended masters. If you've read your Bible, you know we're obviously talking about demons. But uh, these ascended masters, according to Alice Bailey, would take over her body and write these books. And the world core curriculum that the UN says should be taught in every school on the planet was inspired by Alice Bailey and her ascended masters. Well, here's what she wrote, or her demons wrote, in uh, Education in the New Age, okay? If we want to know what the new education system is going to look like, we ought to read her books if they're based on her teachings. They said the world citizenship should be the goal of the enlightened with a world federation and a world brain, which kind of takes on a new meaning in the age of the Internet, doesn't it? 
uh, our problem is to attain the kind of overall synthesis that uh, Marxism and neo-scholasticism provide for their followers, but to get this by the freely chosen cooperative methods that John Dewey advocated. Okay, so we're back full circle to Dewey. Now, in 2015, the UN put out this report on education for all, looking at their progress. They said when they started, there was only 12 countries in the world that had national education systems with national tests. By the time this report came out, there was over 100. In America, we call that system Common Core. Now, Bill Gates, you know, everybody knows Bill Gates funded Common Core, $2.4 billion of his own money. What less people know is that in 2004, he went over to UNESCO headquarters in Paris and signed an agreement with UNESCO. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly actually got the document and posted it on the internet. They agreed they were going to create a global master syllabus, global master teacher training program, global standards, global curricula, global technological program, so all the kids in the world could learn the same garbage. Now, they're not kidding, right? Here's a propaganda video produced by the people who brought you Common Core explaining exactly what's going on here. Up until now... It's been pretty hard to tell how well kids are competing in school and how well they're going to do when they get out of school. Is a girl in your neighborhood being taught as much as her friend over in the next one? Is a graduating senior in, say, St. Louis as prepared to get a job as the graduate in Shanghai? Well, it turns out the answer to both of these questions is no. Because Shanghai, years, right? That's a weird states choice. have been setting different standards for what students should know and be able to do at each grade level. What we really need are clear goals. That's where the Common Core state standards come in. The standards are consistent from school to school, and they match up against international standards. They match too. up against international now standards. And there you have Seattle, Chicago, like Shanghai, and Paris. So even though local communities will still design their own curriculum, with the same rules, everybody can compete on the same kind of staircase. Should our children in America be learning from the same standards that the victims of mass murdering communist Chinese dictators learn from? I would hope not, right? And they say, oh, we have shared values. Oh, I wonder what shared values those might be, <laughs> okay? Uh, now, all this is really bad news, and I know for, for some of you who've never seen this stuff, it's probably overwhelming and incredibly depressing. Um, but there are solutions, and there is some good news. Uh, one of the really good pieces of great news is that 7 out of 10 Americans want their children out of the public school system. Right? They would not send their children there if they didn't believe they had to. The problem is they don't recognize how urgent this situation is. Right? It's like the building's on fire, and they don't realize. Okay? So uh, talking about solutions, you know, what can we do about this? Can we reform this system? Well, I would say no, you can't. It's doing, you know, people say it's broken. It's not broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's making your kids dumber more indoctrinated, more hateful, more anti-American. They reject the word of God. Why? Because that's what the people who created it wanted it to do. So you can't fix it if it's not broken. Uh, I argue, uh, well, actually, the humanists argue, this was interesting. They said the classroom is going to become the arena of conflict between the rotting corpse of Christianity, is what they say, right, in this book, um, uh, in, the, in the Humanist magazine in 1983, and the new faith, humanism. Okay, and they're not kidding. Uh, Orisus Brownson, remember the guy who blew the whistle on the secret society that uh, Robert Owen set up? He said their goal was to destroy Christianity. And the way they were going to do it was to create a government school system where they were going to exclude all religion. So this is what it was intended to do from the beginning. Now, if we can't fix it, what can we do? Well, we've got to get our children out as quickly as possible in as large a numbers as possible. And I know you're thinking, oh, we're not going to be able to get all of them out. Eh, that's probably true. Okay, but if we can get... 30% of them out, we'll have a much better chance of protecting our families, protecting our liberty, protecting our nation than if we leave 87% of them in this indoctrination system. So we need to think, uh, as my good friend uh, E. Ray Moore says, in terms of Dunkirk, right? And for those of you who went to public school, a quick refresher, um, the British Army was stuck on the beaches at Dunkirk, completely surrounded by Adolf Hitler's National Socialists. They were on the verge of being totally annihilated. And so the British people got on their knees and they prayed and they said, God, we really need your help, please. And then they got to work, right? Uh, every Everything that could float went across the English Channel, picked up as many fighting men as possible, and took them back. Fishing boats, commercial vessels, shipping boats, navy ships, yachts, whatever it was. And guess what? They're not speaking German in the British Isles today. Thank goodness. Uh, they may be speaking Arabic soon, but we'll leave that subject for another day. But that's what we need now, right? We need a Dunkirk operation to rescue our children. We've got churches all across America. They're sitting empty six, well, now seven days a week right, with coronavirus. Uh, those could all be schools. We could be, I mean, there's plenty of resources in the body of Christ to get our children out of this system. So parents, uh, I, I probably you know, don't even need to say it, but just to be crystal clear, you've got to get your children out. Okay, you've got to get them out. And you know, I don't blame you. I don't judge you. You didn't know this was going on, but you've got to get them out. Grandparents, talk to your children. Get your grandchildren out. 
You saw what they're doing to them, right? And think about it as a fire, okay? The school building is on fire, only it's worse than a fire because a fire only hurts your children physically. Right now, the schools are destroying your children mentally, academically, spiritually, morally, and physically, right? They're, for goodness gracious, they're, they're actually mutilating your children under the guise of giving them sex changes. What more do you need? The school building is on fire. We're not gonna set up a committee. We're not gonna have a petition. We're not gonna go do a protest. We're gonna run inside the building, grab our children, and run out that door as quickly as we can, and then sound the alarm so that everybody else can get their children out. That's the terms we need to be thinking in. Now, uh, pastors... I know there's more and more pastors who now are doing the right thing. You have got to tell your congregation about this, right? The devil is like a lion and he's trying to devour the children in your congregation. You're supposed to be the shepherd. You're supposed to be keeping the sheep safe. If you don't tell them what's going on in the public schools, you're not doing your job. And now you know. Now you can't unlearn it. So go tell your congregation, right? Rabbis, priests, whatever it is, you've got to tell them. Help provide alternatives. You could set up a school right in your church. And as always, we need to go back to the word of God so we can understand what is the purpose of an education. Uh, and God says it's so that you can have a good job and then buy a nice car and then go retire in Florida. No, right? Uh, and who should be in charge? Uh, well, if you open your Bible, you, Caesar should be in charge. Wait, no, right? Caesar shouldn't be in charge. And the purpose of education is not to get you a good job. Uh, this is what God says about education. He says, you parents should train up the child in the way that he should go. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. He's not talking to Caesar. He's talking to you, mom, you, dad. Uh, in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you wake up, when you lie down. There's no time. It doesn't say when, whenever Caesar doesn't have them, right? It's like all the time you need to be teaching your children. That's what homeschoolers do, and that's what you should be doing. We also know about education. God's word teaches us a lot about education. You go to Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7. God tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And here we are sending our kids off to school where we know they can't even mention the name of the Lord, much less teach the kids the fear of the Lord, and we think they're going to get knowledge and wisdom. Okay, we need to go back to our Bible, right? They're not going to get any knowledge. They're not going to get any wisdom. It's a fraud. It's a counterfeit. It's a failure. There's no knowledge in the public school system. And what happens when you don't have knowledge? Well, God tells us again, right? Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In Isaiah, God tells us his people go into captivity for lack of knowledge. Sound familiar, guys? We're going into captivity. We're on the verge of being destroyed because we don't have any knowledge because we sent our kids to be educated in schools where you can't even mention the Lord, okay? Harvard was a good school at one time, true story. Uh, this is what they said was the purpose of education. The main end of the student's life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's the main end of life, right? That is the purpose of education, and Harvard understood that once. Uh, we were blessed to be born in a free country where we have self-government, and that means there's a secondary purpose to education. That is to be able to govern ourselves. Okay, God told us the purpose of government, Romans 13, is to punish evil. How are you going to govern yourselves and punish evil if we don't even know what God says is evil? God says murder is evil. God says thievery is evil. God says rape is evil. So all these things, that's how we know how to govern ourselves. We need God's word. And, uh, you know, homeschooling is a lot of fun. Uh, there's a picture of my family. You guys probably saw them running around somewhere. They're here. Uh, but we're in really good company, right? These men here were all primarily educated at home by their parents, by their siblings, by their grandparents, and sometimes by private tutors. And guess what? They went on to create the greatest, freest, most prosperous nation in all of human history. Okay, so if they could do it, we can do it too. Uh, lots of great encouraging data on homeschooling. Uh, you know, this corona crisis is probably going to add millions more to our ranks, but we've got millions of children being homeschooled now. They are running circles around the victims of the government schools, even on the government's own tests, right? They're like 30 to 40 percentile points higher on the government standardized academic achievement test. Um, there's also a lot of good private schools for parents who maybe don't feel like they can do it. I think you can, but, you know, if you're under a court order or something, there's a lot of good private schools. There's also a lot of bad ones, so do your due diligence. You wouldn't trust a random stranger to come into your house and teach your children. Don't just hand them to any random stranger. Do your due diligence. Uh, Freedom Project Academy is an online K-12 through Christian school that I work with. Uh, great choice for those who want uh, some help. Um, Public School Exit is a ministry that uh, we founded recently. My friend E. Ray Moore and I, and also Dran Reese and Dr. Duke Pesta. We're the uh, four founding members. We've got an incredible advisory board, including a lot of the wonderful people here. Uh, Sam Sorbo, Rebecca Friedrichs, Kim Fletcher. Uh, wonderful, wonderful people involved with this. And our goal is to rescue as many children as humanly possible from the indoctrination, the dumbing down, and the sexualization. We've got some cards. It's publicschoolexit.com. Uh, we want to knock down every possible barrier. You can't afford it. We'll We'll find a way to get you a scholarship. We'll find a partner school where you can get the kid in. 
anything we need to do to get your children out, we're ready to help do it. Uh, now, the UN is coming for us, right? They, they passed a resolution in 2015. They said, you can't have all these unregulated private schools teaching whatever they want. Uh, you got to have the government overseeing them, enforcing the same standards. Uh, and it's already happening in America, right? Here in New York, they're now threatening the, uh, the yeshivas. Say, oh, you're not teaching them enough uh, government mandates, so we're going to shut down all your Jewish schools. Well, they're coming for the Christian schools, too. In Florida now, they're all writing all these uh, in all the newspapers. Oh, they're the LGBT discrimination, and they're teaching the kids that the Bible is true. How dare they? Right? So they're coming for our private schools. They're coming for the homeschool. Schoolers. We need to be aware of that. And just a refresher, they're indoctrinating, they're sexualizing your children, they're dumbing them down uh, un at an unbelievable scale. And, you know, a lot of us uh, who love America, who love liberty, well, I've got the Second Amendment, right? They'll never take my freedom. They're, I, I got my gun. And, you know, I, I'm all about the Second Amendment, too. I'm a huge Second Amendment supporter. But guess what, guys? They don't need your guns. They've got your kids, okay? What are you going to do with your guns when your kids are the ones who show up to take them? The answer is absolutely nothing. You're going to hand them over. Okay, so with the, with the kids, they don't need our guns. They'll come for those when they're good and ready. Now, Hitler put it like this. He said, when an opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I just calmly say, your child belongs to us already. You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand firmly in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. And folks, that's where we are now. Talk to your average victim of a government school. Ask them about our history. Ask them about the Bible. They know nothing. They know climate change. They know gender ideology. They know transgenderism. They know all that. But they don't know anything about anything that matters. We're there now, folks. We have a, a massive, massive project ahead of us if we're going to turn this around. So as Ray says, we need an exodus from the government school system. Uh, you probably all got a copy of this magazine as you walked in. For those of you watching at home uh, on Roku, on the Tech and Network, and uh, on live stream and all that, Get a copy of this. Go to the newamerican.com slash rescuing our children. Uh, it's a special report that we did. Uh, Ray, Dr. Duke, uh, Israel Wayne, a whole bunch of amazing people collaborated to make this happen. You can also get the DVD of uh, one version of this talk and help get the word out. Give it to your pastor. Uh, I want to close with a scripture because I don't want anybody to think that like if we just go vote the right way or if we just you know go have a protest or something or, or even just get our kids out of the public school that everything's going to be okay. Um, it's not a political battle. It's not an economic battle. It's not even an educational battle. It's a spiritual battle and God makes that very clear to us in his word. Uh, I love Ephesians 6.12 because there's just no way of getting around it. You can't misinterpret it. God just tells you in plain English what's going on here. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil wants your kids and your grandkids. And if you don't protect them, nobody else is going to do it for you. Thank you guys so much. God bless you, and God bless America. We got one from... Uh online. By the way, we got kicked off Facebook, which means we're doing something right. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Where is this? How does the International Baccalaureate Program fit into the UN goal? Great question. Uh, and I actually went to international schools all my life, and that was always a big thing, the International Baccalaureate. Oh, we're so sophisticated. We're so worldly. Well, the IB program uh, is a project of the United Nations, uh, and it is designed to brainwash children into the ideology of globalism. Now, God tells us that he's the one who created the nations. In fact, he says that multiple times in his word. God created the nations. Uh, globalism is evil by definition. In fact, the last time they tried to create a global government, they built this big tower, and God was so upset he came down and uh, confused their languages, right? So God doesn't like globalism, but the IB program is specifically designed to train up a managerial class of brainwashed globalists who will run the global system. And, you know, I, I grew up in this world, so I'm very familiar with it. The kids involved in this, they actually believe this stuff. They believe that they're doing good. They believe that if we get rid of nation states, we can get rid of war, and we can all live in peace, happiness, harmony, and we can sing kumbaya, right? But uh, God tells us what happens when they say, oh, peace, safety. Yeah, right, we're not going to get that. So the IB program is very, very dangerous. Um, it is specifically designed to instill globalism in the minds of the children who they think will be not the real elite, but the kind of wannabe elite, right? The managers who will oversee the globalist system. Very, very dangerous program, and I would advise parents to stay away from it and children. Thank you. Again, I invite anybody to ask a question if you have any. Um, I have one. So 
when was the point when, I mean, your research is so extensive, it's amazing. What was the point where you really realized what was going on and wanted to dig deeper? Well, good question. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I never experienced the American public school system. It's kind of a weird story. I grew up outside of the United States, and then I was actually, I didn't even finish high school either, like Sam. I was expelled in like 10th grade and never went back because I thought it was dumb. So, you know, all I knew was that I didn't like school, that it was stupid, that it was boring, but, you know, other kids seemed to do okay. So, uh, But then as I started journalism, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, I came across a little blurb in my local newspaper about these national standards. I was like, hmm, that's interesting, national standards. I thought we lived in a constitutional republic where the Tenth Amendment says all powers not uh, delegated to the United States were reserved to the states and the people. Wh who's making national standards? That's weird. So I started digging into it, and I came across Common Core. and started writing about Common Core. And that kind of opened up the whole box of worms. And so um, I wrote a lot of articles about Common Core, and then I got a call, I think, in 2013 from my Dr. Sam Blumenfeld in WND Publishing, asking if I wanted to collaborate with Dr. Blumenfeld on a book about education. I was like, really? I would love to. That would be amazing. So I worked with uh, Dr. Blumenfeld for a year, and and that from I, I had to go read all his books that he had been he'd been writing books on education since the 60s, 70s. Uh, I think he wrote 12 or 13 overall, and that was like you know, 100 years worth of research and education condensed into a year. Uh, so that was incredible. And it was when I was working with Dr. Blumenfeld that it hit me. You know, all these other things that we're fighting for, you know, the, the unborn babies, to rein in the government, to stop the United Nations, you know, to stop the commune, all these other things, we're going to lose on every single one of these issues if we don't address the education crisis because that's their primary weapon. And so that's why, uh, you know, after writing that book with Dr. Blumenfeld, I said, I've really got to focus on this like a laser because this is the battle where all the other battles are going to be fought and won or lost. And so that's kind of what brought me to that realization. And uh, I've been on that mission ever since, and I don't intend to stop as long as the Lord gives me breath. I have another question. So once we all leave here today and we go on with our busy lives, can you give us some advice? Like, what what are some, um, what's some action that we can take here forward? How can we spread the word about the public school exit and talk to people about this issue? Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, I think the most important thing for parents, you know, the most important thing you can do for your children and for your family and for your country is to get your children out of the schools. Okay, and after you're done with that, you know, then we still need you, right? Your job's not over. I know homeschooling is, is a big task, but we still need you. And so help us get the word out there. You know, your average parent, they know something's wrong. They want their children out, but they don't know how bad it is. Uh, and the same is true with a lot of pastors. So we need to educate the opinion molders in our communities, the pastors, the rabbis, the radio hosts, the, the business people in our community, because they can help us get the word out. And so we've got a lot of resources and tools for that. Uh, the Rescuing Our Children magazine is one. Uh, we've got the second edition, so or, order a hundred of those and, and give them to the elders at your church and give them to uh, you know public school teachers, your neighbors, your children, whoever it is, so that they understand what's going on here. Uh, publicschoolexit.com is our website. Lots and lots of resources there. If you need help, we're partnering with Christian schools all across America to help put uh, children in there. And we, you know, we've got things you can print out. If, if you want to talk to your pastor, we've got a, a flyer you can print out on the biblical reasons why uh, children should not be with Caesar all day. So those are the types of resources that we hope people will use. That's why we're creating them. We hope people will use these resources to educate others in their community, and then uh, we can rescue as many children as possible. Thank you, Alex, so much. Thank Again, you. a round of applause for Alex. That was just amazing. Please stay tuned. We have an amazing panel of all the speakers. You can send your questions. Now is the time to send your questions through the live chat, as well as our um, audience here come up with some questions. We have a few minutes of a break. There is nothing in this world more precious than a child. We treasure the immeasurable value and undeserved gift of children. God calls on all of us to protect the minds of our children from those who regard them as commodities. Marxist indoctrination, sex trafficking, and the enticement of the pop culture industry are crimes being committed against our children even as we speak. And that's why we are here. Would you join us in an effort to rescue them. Text the word rescuing to 50155 to donate any amount. Thank you.